I'm standing on the very tip of Long Reef Headland at low tide on a nice sunny day with a relatively low surf and I'm standing on the oldest sedimentary rock in Sydney, the Bolgo Sandstone. But looking back across the rest of the platform, you can see that this outcrop is quite a bit different from the main part of the platform, which is the widest, most extensive shore platform in the Sydney coast, which has some fascinating geology and some wonderful biology, and we're going to take you around and show you a lot of it. This is Long Reef Headland. It stands 36 metres above sea level, and it's 10 kilometres north of Sydney Harbour. We can see that this aptly named feature is exposed to waves from three directions. Over time, the cliffs have retreated, exposing the geology and leaving behind the widest and flattest shore platform in Sydney. The platform is eroded into extensive low tide flats, hollows, pools, gutters, and provides an abundance of living space for a diversity of intertidal organisms that are easy to examine at low tide. Long Reef Aquatic Reserve was established in 1980 to protect this environment and it extends 100 metres into the sea right around the headland. With an interesting geology and a fascinating biology, Long Reef has been visited by geologists, biologists and students for decades. There's no rod system but what it uses for sticking on is just to keep it fixed. Now the word algae... It's now our turn to explore it and we'll begin at Dy Lagoon. Okay we're at the north end of Long Reef Beach where there's a surprising outcrop of grey clays and a very dark black peaty horizon underneath the sand dunes. It's a swamp environment that's been preserved in the beach face. It's a highly organic peat sitting on top of grey clays, which was the bed was the bed of a lagoon. We can see the grey clays clearly down here, a very sharp boundary into the organic peaty material, and it runs about 50 centimetres thick at this point to there, uh, with a couple of minor layers above that with sand in between them, and then there's a grey sand on top of it which is a natural soil profile sitting on top of the, on the edge of the lagoon or on top of the peat. Above the grey sand we have lots of recent windblown sand and that stuff is all 20th century because this whole area was extensively denuded of vegetation by the 1940s and the dunes were quite active. At the end of the modern sand we can actually see layers of iron stained metal and plastic and rubber which are dumped there at some stage just as rubbish possibly during the 1974 storms. But the more interesting bits is the peat itself and if we come along a bit further we can see another section of it where again we have the grey clay at the base of the lagoon, the layer of peat which is rather thinner at this point telling us something about water levels perhaps and on top of that a brown sand which is just stuffed full of tiny little snails, freshwater snails. So we've got freshwater lagoon situation here, now buried by dune sands. And a little further across, we've got a, quite a large log, 20 centimetres or so across, totally rotten. Uh, it's decomposed into just muck. And this one is clearly eucalyptus because of the, what little bit of grain I can still see on it. So it's probably a swamp uh, mahogany or something of that nature, well and truly rotted away. And it's at the top of the sequence, so it's probably younger than 4,000 years old, but it is, this, is part of this overall story. What I've just done there is show you how a geologist works. This is the youngest geological deposit on the Long Reef Peninsula. 4,000 years is nothing in geological terms, but I've shown you how it's layered and how we can read each of these layers. And if we looked at the materials even more closely with my microscopes and so forth, we could pull out pollen grains and learn what sort of plants were growing in the swamp. We could probably pull out other snails and perhaps some forams and other sorts of freshwater species. And then the big question is, how does this fit into the modern day environment where it's sitting now at high water mark? It clearly isn't a swamp anymore, but if 4,000 years ago it had to be well behind the beach and above high water mark, so otherwise it wouldn't be functioning as a, salt, a freshwater environment. So there's a puzzle in that which we haven't fully worked out, but that's how geology goes. Come along past the creek which is currently draining the golf course, a whole lot of boulders that they've been dumped in there for protecting the, the, the sand from 
beach erosion. And it becomes interesting here because the peat is becoming thinner. Uh, the soil at the base is the same sort of grey clay with a bit of brown clay underneath it. Then there's two, three layers of peat, but they're each discrete and relatively thin, 10, 15 centimetres max. And if we look along the length of it, the peat pinches out right up to the walkway here. There's no peat in this little section and I'm literally standing on the edge of the old lagoon. Looking at, back across the whole thing, it goes from zero to about 50 centimetres thick and it's dropped about a metre. So we can estimate that there's at least a metre of water across this little flat here over a distance of about 25, 30 metres. Looking back along the beach, we can ask if this peat bed was once part of DY Lagoon. That's possible, but the bed of the lagoon is probably too high and the peat has not been traced that far. An alternative is that it connects with the swamps that used to lie on the lower part of the golf course and which are now represented by artificial wetlands. More work is needed to finish this story and that's also a common refrain in geology. The next feature on the headland is this great big outcrop of red rock which has been described as laterite by various authors but it's a real puzzle as to what on earth it is and how it formed. It appears to be bedded conformably with the rest of the Triassic rocks but it's quite a different material and it's certainly not like your normal laterite if there is such a thing and it's a bugger to try to walk across because all of the hollows in it are where the grey clays underneath it have been fretted out leaving this nasty honeycomb which I stagger across and try and find my way to a nice little bit of outcrop just up here. Looking more closely at this red rock we've got lots of angular fragments of other rocks within it. That makes it a breccia in geological terms but it doesn't necessarily help us much in terms of explaining it except that we can see that there are sandstone fragments, this large white one and a little higher up there's bits of quartzite up in here and at the top there are lots of angular pieces that look like ironstone which could come from pretty well anywhere in this Triassic section. It does appear to be bedded conformably with the rest of the geology which makes me think it's probably a Triassic formation. And we've got a nice big thick section of our same red rock here. And across on the far face we can see that there's less of the rock and more of the grey clay, which is the stuff that weathers out and makes it so hard to get across. Above that you go into an orangey clay, which is the weathered profile. And on the very top of the profile, underneath the bitter bush, is windblown sand. So again we've got a nice stratigraphic sequence of a whole range of different ages of material right through to the present day. Over the last 150 years, the rocks have had different names. They used to be loosely referred to as chocolate shales. They were later formally named the Collaroy Claystone. And today they're called the Bald Hill Claystone, the type section of which outcrops at the southern end of the Royal National Park. Drilling data shows the continuity of the sequence between these distant places. Geological names are shorthand descriptions the suites of rocks that geologists believe have common properties and genesis. They're frequently subject to change and aren't formalised until they're published. Whenever a new worker reviews an established sequence, they often revise the naming and although the rocks remain, their stories may change. Coming up the beach, the Triassic geology is showing up quite clearly and at this point we've got the Bald Hill Claystone just starting to come into the picture with this wedge of purpley red-brown mudstone sitting over a grey show and above it a very fractured and closely jointed weathered siltstone which will be in the Newport Formation. The Bald Hill Claystone has been variously described as a red bed or a tonstein. A red bed is simply a sedimentary rock which is red. That doesn't tell us much as there are numerous ways in which iron oxides like hematite can concentrate in sediments or rock, and what's red at the weathering surface is not necessarily red at depth. 
As for tonstein, this is a German word that translates as claystone, referring to a compact rock composed of kaolinite and iron oxides. It originally described volcanic ash deposits in European coal seams. There is no coal here, and the usual model for the Bald Hill claystone is that it was deposited on the floodplain of a river flowing from the east. Other authors have preferred deposition in a tidal estuary. These fancy words like laterite, red beds, tonstein and many others all come with attached meanings. The jargon of experts can often be traced back to a great man who once had a bright idea. Because he was a great man, and they nearly always were men, the idea became accepted without question. In accepting the jargon without question, we may actually limit inquiry instead of improving our understanding. Both the Bald Hill Claystone and the overlying Gary Formation, which may or may not be present on Glong Reef, depending on which geologist you read, do contain minerals and clay pellets of volcanic origin that can be interpreted as tuff or volcanic ash. So using the term tonstein is not completely inappropriate, but is it necessary? Recognising the volcanic ash minerals is an important observation, as ashfall deposits can blanket a landscape, and that would explain the persistence of the Bald Hill Claystone over such a long length of coast from Stanwell Tops to Bulgola, its recognition in drill core inland to Thirlmere Lakes, and its probable extension even further north, where it may correlate with the Patonga Claystone. This significantly changes our thinking about the nature of the mid-Triassic environment. Somewhere in this cliff, there was once a tunnel exploring for copper. We can find no trace of it. Although the claystone does contain tiny green blobs of copper minerals, samples of which were probably sent to Sir Joseph Banks in 1800. The prospecting story is confused, and although the archives of the Geological Survey are said to hold a map of the mine, it cannot be found in their catalogue, and references describing the operation seem to be hiding somewhere. Some sources suggest the prospecting occurred in the 1880s, but one firm reference is a short paragraph in a Wagga Wagga newspaper mentioning the search for copper and silver in 1903. The search for the records is as frustrating as was the search for copper. There is no ore body in these rocks. There, there, and another little bit right across there, but not enough to get excited about. Another nice long section of the whole of the Triassic sequence here. Coming down from the top, we have a, a very coarse, blocky outcrop of sandstone itself. And then right at the base, we're back in the Bald Hill Claystone. But a couple of interesting features of it this time. That plane there and that plane there are both fault lines. And it's difficult to see how the blocks have moved relative to one another. But that relative to that, like that, on that surface there, and lower down at a slightly different angle, again there, and we can see the scrape marks or the polish marks on that face, which is giving us an indication of that movement. These are faults within the strata, not across the strata. Very sharp boundary between the claystone and a lithic sandstone at that point, can put my finger on it literally, that's probably the boundary between Bald Hill and Newport. Several light coloured layers can be seen here on top of the purple clay stones. Notice the thick one just above the shore platform. As many as eight layers have been described as the topsoils of grey-brown podzolic soil profiles formed on stream levees in Triassic times. It was also claimed that the soil was well drained and supported a coniferous forest. The whole sequence has become known as the Long Reef Paleosol Association, a paleosol being a fossil soil. Uh, right at the, at the end of Long Reef Point, uh, we're in the spot in the Bald Hill Claystones where Ritalik recorded a series of fossil soils or paleosols. The best of them is across above the heads of the fishermen, uh, the ochery coloured layer with a finer sort of fabric to it, which is alleged to be both an A and a B horizon of a grey-brown prozolic profile. Beneath that there is another, across here also slightly ochery coloured, uh, but not so well developed, and he recorded a total of seven or eight of these altogether. 
they don't stand up very well to close inspection as a soil material. Uh, they seem to be something within the Bald Hill Claystone, uh, a different sort of weathering horizon, but not necessarily a soil in the sense that we use the word. The wide shore platform at the end of the headland has numerous scattered boulders, rock pools, long joint plane crevices and subtle differences in elevation where individual beds create curving patterns occupied by different species of algae. A volcanic dike of basalt slices across the platform with a northwesterly strike. This is a vertical sheet of igneous rock injected into the sedimentary sequence sometime before the Tasman Sea began opening up 84 million years ago. Dikes are reasonably common near Sydney, but difficult to find, except when exposed like this. A close-up view shows that it's slightly weathered, has numerous short offsets along its length, and it has altered the intruded rocks with a thin zone of contact metamorphism. We've crossed the big wide platform out at the end of the point, and we've picked up the volcanic dike running it's, it's about a metre and a half wide at the moment. It's rather weathered out and a bit hard to pick. It just looks like another lot of brown rock. More to find here from there across to my foot. Quite clear there. And at this point here, it actually splits. So that we've got one lot of dike setting across to another lot of dike. And there's no visible connection between them. I look at the shale on either side and it's not disturbed by any faulting. This is the place where the dike has been injected up through the rocks over here, met some sort of a barrier and has had to offset across there by that metre and a half or so and then continued on. In the middle of the next piece of dike we have some pretty fresh rock at this point, relatively weathered there and on the margins the hot volcanic rock has baked the siltstones and the shales in a zone of contact metamorphism, making them a little bit harder and tougher. Quite clear, right through. Continues on and uh, cross past the big lump of sandstone that's washed up on top of it. The dike again with a very nice contact metamorphic zone along this edge. Right in the middle of a wide part of the dike, it's almost unweathered, nice and black, clearly volcanic, and all the little white crystals in it are felspars or felspathoids, and they're slightly platy and they're oriented in the same direction as the dike, so they've been moved in the flow in the volcanic rock as it flowed up through the bedrock. A stepped outcrop of quartz lithic sandstone, known as the Bulgo sandstone, forms a small island at high tide. The rock description simply means that the sand-sized grains are composed of both quartz and rock fragments. This is the top of the oldest rock on Long Reef as it underlies the Bald Hill Claystone. Offshore drilling has shown that the unit is as much as 100 metres thick and it's thought to have been deposited in river channels. A higher view of the shore platform shows that most boulders occur on the southeastern point. There is little sand along the southern shore, and the largest waves at the time of filming were southeasterly swell waves. As the camera moves out, the bigger view shows waves breaking on all shores, but they're smaller on the north side. We also see a small sand spit and a length of sandy beach along the north shore. This pattern of energy distribution changes when northeasterly storms arrive but the swell waves are most common through the year. Two sets of waves cross one another before breaking on the rocks. As waves enter shallow water, they are refracted by the seafloor and concentrate energy on headlands. The widest part of the shore platform on Long Reef is at the headland because the soft rock here has been eroded back at a faster rate than anywhere else. The interesting questions are how fast does this happen and how long has it taken for the platform to form? The answers are not clear, but we are confident that the platforms have gone through numerous periods of higher sea level over the past five million years, 
with at least three short periods in the last one million years. In a geological time frame, the coast is incredibly dynamic. We crossed the dike again over the ephemeral sand spit to a boulder beach below a grassy hill slope with a sand beach in the distance. Boulders here rarely move and are neatly stacked or imbricated on one another. The hill slope is dune sand and much of the vegetation has been restored in recent years by reef care volunteers. It used to be a mess of bitu bush and bare sand which children used for tobogganing on sheets of cardboard. A small Aboriginal midden is located where the pathway cuts the base of the slope. It's composed of intertidal shell species. Given the abundance of natural foods on the platform, it's surprising that the midden is so small, but there's no fresh water in this vicinity to support long-term occupation. This beach used to be fenced to protect the planted vegetation, but the fence was destroyed by a storm in 2016, and children are again using the sand as a slipway. The dune sand on this cliff face is delivered from the beach by northeasterly winds, and it's frequently recycled from beach to dune and back again. Like most small beaches in Sydney, it's a closed cell, and the volume of visible sand is more or less fixed. With ongoing sea level rise, this little beach is at risk if more sand is moved further offshore during big storms. Coming down off the imbricated boulders at the end of the point, we come onto the beach and at various times you can see a lot of black sand uh, concentrated at the back of the tide line. If we dig into this stuff and clean up a face carefully, we can see that we've actually got layers and layers of black sand and yellow sands. The black sands are heavy minerals. Uh, they've got a higher density than the ordinary quartz and crushed up shell. So they're washed up by storm waves and they don't tend to move so much by the wind. They're the same heavy minerals as you find in beach mining episodes further up on the north coast and through to Fraser Island. It'll be ilmenite, magnetite, zircon, uh, rutile and a few other minerals. And we can work out what some of them are by taking a magnet, just gently sweeping it over the sand and it's, it's moving the causing it to collapse there, but it's picking up the magnetic ones on the end of my magnet. They'll be nearly all magnetite grains. Pretty fine grain. Because they're denser, they behave as if they're larger uh, in, the, in, the, in the waves and the wind. This sand contains a higher proportion of broken shell, which slowly dissolves in percolating rainwater. When the carbonate solution reaches salt water in the beach face, calcium carbonate can be precipitated and this cements the basal sand as beach rock. In 2016, the beach here was washed out, or the dune really, was washed out by a big storm, and the base of the dune was cemented as a carbonate beach rock. There was a lot of it caking all of the bedrock here, uh, right down to high water mark. And this year, 2021, it's all gone, except this one little bit of outcrop which is caking the sticking on the rocks here and there. It's a very soft cemented sand, dune sand, and it probably dissolves pretty quickly in fresh water. Not too bloody easy to brust. There you go. Nothing to it, just cemented sand. Geological processes at work are removing geology very, very quickly, a period of six years, five years, which makes you wonder how fast the cliffs themselves are going back. We know that the sand dunes behind me are um, erode away very quickly indeed but they do tend to be replaced and further around that we have the big slumps in the white clay and the sea gets up to the base of those and washes them out pretty quickly and I suspect that the whole of Long Reef is moving back at the rate of maybe something like a, a couple of metres in a century uh, probably a lot faster than we think. Coming around on the north side of the headland We've got a huge stack of those red rock boulders down on the shore platform. And if we come closer to them, we can see that this is the same stuff as we were puzzling about on the south side of the platform. It's a breccia, lots of very angular fragments in there, bits of sandstone, lots of ironstone. I don't see anything in the way of trace fossils much. And it's got all the same hole features that we had before when I was stumbling on. And if we look up past the warning sign, so I'd better not stay long, you can see that it's fallen from the top of the cliff. 
where we've got exactly the same sort of profile that we had on the far side and here it is clearly within the Newport formation. So it's a Triassic rock, got nothing to do with laterites in the ordinary sense that we use that word. Just a little further on I think we've solved the puzzle that we had about where did the Aborigines get a drink because we've got a series of small water seepages, springs if you like, coming out of the rock, coming out of the joint blades in the rocks and precipitating a whole lot of iron stalactite like material there and the question is is it fresh or is it salt? All I need is a, a billy can or something but I'll use my finger, fresh as you like. So it'd be pretty easy to get a drink from here using a couple of half shells just to collect the water as it comes out or perhaps dig a little hole into the rock and you'd have a permanent supply. We had been puzzling about that. Uh, plant fossils are, are not common on Long Reef but we do get a bit. Uh, there's a few here, fra mostly fragments of charcoal and broken up leaves. But here's a rather longer one which you can clearly see was a, a small log and it's been converted to coal. Uh, squashed flat by the weight of the overlying sediments. But there are no coal seams in the, in the Triassic. Uh, we're past the Permian extinction event and after that coal is very, very rare. Stepping back from the freshwater springs, we can see that these occur in the hollow of a synclinal fold. Rainwater seeps down through the weathered rock, which acts as a groundwater reservoir. Along this section, the claystone shows multiple layers of the alleged fossil soils, but closer examination of the sequence reveals numerous trace fossils, which all suggest that this was a shallow marine or estuarine environment rather than stream bank levees. Here are two examples within the Bald Hill claystone on the shore platform. We're in a, a nice little bed of, of grey mudstone with these rather large nodular features in it and this particular big one you can see that it's got a lot of sort of scratchy marks on the outside surface of it. Well that outside surface is actually the inside surface of a burrow. The burrow is this size all right around here and these scrape marks are where the animal that lived in here burrowed through the soft sediment and left its claw marks on the inside of the burrow. The burrow was then filled in with the sediment which was standing up here somewhere above it and probably had a fair bit of iron oxides in it by the look of it and that's consolidated as a harder piece of rock and so it now stands up in relief. And there are here uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, there's, there's more than 25 or 30 of these just in 10 metres of rock platform all in the same bed. We don't actually know what the animal was, it lived back in the Triassic times, and it, but the, the fossil form has been given the name Tarometa ichnus. They obviously it comes from Tarometa headland as the original type locality. We think it was a sort of a crayfish. We have a, a sequence of bedded sandstones and siltstones here and in each of the beds there are multiple burrows, again infilled like the larger one we saw earlier, like that fellow there, uh, quite a large one across here. And as you come up through the rock you find very, very small ones like that. Another one going up the top there which seems to have some lateral uh, branches at the top of it in one of the beds. And when you come right through to the rock surface you can see them all the way up, even tiny ones here. And on the bedding plane itself, we have these circular features which are actually the same burrows in cross section. We don't know what the organism is, once again, there are lots of them. And as the sediment moves, settles on the sea floor, on the estuary floor, and starts to harden up, these things are burrowing through it, working their way up through many generations. Preservation of these forms suggests that the trace fossils all lived in quiet, shallow waters, and the discovery of carbonised logs fragmented leaf fossils and a large amphibian carnivore with a mouthful of nasty teeth called Bulgosuchus gargantua all support the idea that this was a shallow marine or estuarine environment subject to volcanic ash falls or surges of reworked ash with a frequency low enough for life to keep on going. This part of the cliff frequently fails by slumping, rilling and even during dry weather the claystone frets away and forms cones of debris at the cliff base that are soon washed away by waves. This section of cliff 
is fast receding. With well, the cliff is fretting away even in the dry weather, the shale desiccates and, and starts to crumble and comes cascading down the slope forming all these little debris cones. And when there's no really high tides or storms, there's those cones just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But then when a storm comes, they all wash out and disappear and the process starts again. And then Fisherman's Beach runs red. This wide section of the shore platform supports a dense stand of Neptune's necklace, Hormosaura banksii, first described by Sir Joseph Banks from Botany Bay. It's the way Hormosaura ends up at the end of each year. Slowly dies off and breaks down and ends up as... It's, it's instant compost. <laughs> yeah, wonderful compost. <laughs> well, this is the end result of all of the, the Hormosaura dying off from the sunburn and breaking off and being washed up on the beach of the high tide mark. This stuff, some of it's still alive, but it's not going anywhere and it's not going to last much longer. It's now too high and will stay too dry uh, to survive and it can't re-anchor, uh, so it's sort of finished. Uh, the black pieces all through it are the burnt pieces. and uh, They probably dried out on the beach here, but a lot of them may well have died out while they were still alive live and growing on the rocks. Back, back to the oysters, Phil. Why do we have oysters here? Especially about this spot. I think there are two reasons. One is that we don't have any mulberry walk, whelks. In the yeah, there's one or two of them here. Yeah. And the mulberry whelks eat oysters. So when the mulberry whelks really come in, they'll fairly quickly eliminate the oysters. But nature avoids a, a bores a vacuum. Something else comes in to replace the oysters. It might be barnacles, it might be limpets, it might be algae. If it's barnacles, the same mulberry whelk loved barnacles too. So it comes in again and eats them. And it also eats limpets, but it doesn't like algae. So there's a constant a dynamic system on a place like this. There's something happening all the time and there's a reason for the change. Might be seasonal, might be predators, might be all sorts of things. So if we were in an experimental mode and we put a whole series of boulders across this little patch, we improve the habitat for mulberry whelks, we might wipe out the oysters. It might, except that the yeah, mulberry whelks have got to eat something or other. So <laughs> what do they eat when the, they've got rid of the oysters? They, they like limpets. In fact, mulberry whelks like most things. They, they're carnivores, but um, they can't survive on algae, so they, they'll die off. But as I say, it's such a dynamic system. There's something always there to replacing something or other that's died out for some reason or other. We finish our flight on Fisherman's Beach where the car park has been protected from erosion by the installation of large geo bags. What is the future of Long Reef with rising sea level? In our flight around the headland, we've seen that the beach and dunes near DY Lagoon have eroded significantly over the last century. We noted that the cliffs appear to be eroding at different rates, with the most rapid being in the unconsolidated dune sand at the eastern end. But the processes there are cyclic with sand being replaced during periods of quieter seas. At the western end, near a fisherman's beach, the cliff lies back at a flatter angle. Frequent slumping is seen, and cliff retreat is obvious over just a few years. As the cliffs retreat, the shore platforms widen, but with rising sea level they will become subtidal rather than intertidal environments. This will involve lateral shift in organisms changes in species diversity and with warmer water more tropical species may survive. The latest ICPP report says that we have three to four millimetres of sea level rise every year and this is expected to increase. You don't need to be a maths genius to see that estimates of around one metre of rise by 2100 are certainly possible if we fail to tackle global warming. Depending on how high sea level rises, whether the tidal range also shifts, and the intensity and frequency of future storms, it will be more difficult for your grandchildren to view the wonders of this intertidal world. That's Bulina Miniata. 
This is Hartina. Mm. And you probably see a lot of these when the tide comes up, that's what I was out here looking for. As the tide comes in, these will emerge from the substrate, start cruising around. They feed on little worms and things. They're beautiful animals. Mm.